Father, just thank you for... Lord, it was just those words this morning that you're an awesome God. And awesome these days is banded around in our culture, just like a throwaway word that everything is awesome. But Lord, actually the reality is there is only one who is awesome. And it is you. We understand that, Lord. We can only but submit and recognize your awesomeness. So, Father, I want to pray for each and every one of us now as we look at your word. We recognize that it is under and it is by and it is through and it is from that awesome God. From you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Well. You'll be either unhappy or happy to know that we are finishing James this morning. I will decide that some of those R's are probably less real than what they came out. I loved and enjoyed doing James. James doesn't pull his punches. We live in a very we should be tolerant type society. The problem is we're incredibly intolerant when it comes down to people who might be saying this is truth whether you like it or not. Especially when it comes from Christians. And what I like about James is he doesn't muck about. There isn't grey areas for James. And so I've enjoyed that because I like it when it's not grey areas. Uh, it makes life very clear. It may not be nice reading. It might pull us up a little bit sharp. But it also, also shows us God's grace throughout the whole of this letter as well. It doesn't just say, have a go, have a go, have a go. There's a lot of about God's grace. You know, your deeds, the things that you do for God, are born out of his grace, born out of your faith in him, not because you need to earn brownie points with God. Which, I'm sorry, it still seems to be some of our backdrop mentality that I've better do this or else God won't be pleased with me this week. God loves you. It's out of that love, you do everything. And that's what I like about James. There's that, there's that in there. But you've really got to read and study and really soak it up to get that. Don't just read the one-liners. Don't, you know... The, the, the early morning texts or the early morning uh, website one verses that you sometimes see on websites, etc. Brilliant. Really great. I find them wonderful. But sometimes you can take it so out of context, you completely miss the rest of the stuff around it. So you do need to read the whole letter. So I hope you've enjoyed it along with me. And uh, we've got a lot to get through this morning. So better get on, on with it. So what did we learn from two weeks ago? Can you remember? Anybody? Two weeks was a long time. I've been on annual leave for a few of those days. This is going to be interesting. Let's do this. Hang on. If you all sat at the front, you wouldn't have to do that. <laughs> uh, basically, I've, I've picked up from there about uh, being quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry, and also our tongue. How much damage it can do. And how much good it can do if we allow it to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm leaving that chair there. Anybody else? Okay, from two weeks ago, there was this part within uh, uh, James 4 that selfish ambition can be disguised as truth-seeking and you can tell the difference that it's selfish ambition or it is somebody really truly wanting after God's kingdom but is evidenced sometimes by the destroyed relationships that it leaves behind. And the repair source is only achieved by submitting to God and our relationship with him. It's all about, for James, this has been this constant to and fro about being the double-minded person. You're either for God or you're for the world. You see that through James, not just about the tongue. The backdrop to all of the problems is actually your double-mindedness. Are you up for God or are you up for the things of the world? And so in these concluding passages, and I are concluding in many ways, that it feels like James sort of goes back over it again to re-emphasize some things. So, are you ready? 
You'd be pleased it's James Dunn. So, chapter 4, verse 13 to 17. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city. Spend a year there. Carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while, then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. See, blunt. Not going to muck about. This continues from the previous passage of deeds done in humility. Humility, we saw two weeks ago, is also is the trademark of the heavenly wise. Those who are gifted of wisdom from heaven do things in humility. Not the, hey, check me out, look what I'm doing. They do it in humility, recognizing things come from God. So James is now carrying on with this letter, needing to write. Now, it's very easy to, at this point, think he's talking to the church. But there's something you need to notice. is now, listen, you who say. Hmm, who's he talking to? In the previous opening chapters, he's always said, brothers, which is determining the Christian church. It's not just, by the way, the again, English translation has it just as males. It's not. It, most, both, it means both male and females. So it's brothers and sisters. But here, he's now saying, now listen, you who say. Okay, who, who are you talking to then, James? If you're not talking to the church, who are you talking to? Now, it's here that most commentators would agree that James is using some form of rhetorical speech. He's trying to explain something to the church, but not directly at them. He's sort of using a wider example. You see that in the Old Testament when David had sinned with Bathsheba, and then the prophet Nathan came up and used the, what would you do if a man did, 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 did this? And then David said, oh, well, we'll sort him out. And, and then David said, you're that man. But he used a completely different story. And this is the same sort of thing that he's seen that this is what James is trying to do. But in the process of this speech, he is also talking to those people outside of the church, and we'll see that in a moment. But it's a way of him pointing out to the Christian community you don't want to be like this lot. I'm not going to say you directly at the moment. It's your attitude. So it would be like me telling a story, something to do with Greenford out there, and an attitude that's out there. But in reality, it's an attitude that is starting to grow and fester in here. Don't panic. I haven't got a story for that today. So this is what he's doing. He's trying to point out the potential pitfalls for the Christian community. And he's doing this, saying you're heading towards this because you're not doing things in humility. How's he doing that? Well, he starts to use this sort of time of indication. So, ready for again? Now, listen you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to this or that city. Spend a year there. Carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? And we'll leave it at that. This is James using an indication of the way that they use time. This lack, remember deeds done in humility? If you're humble, it means you are submitted to God. But if your attitude is one of these that, guess what we're going to do tomorrow? Let's go off into the city, make a million quid, no problem. Bank the money, and then oh, we might hang around for another year, do our own thing, do whatever we want to do, and then we'll disappear off to another city. It's that sort of attitude. This is what we are going to do. These are my plans. It was interesting. I had a few days annual leave this week, just gone. And people asked, oh, what are you doing, you know, over the next few days? So we had our da days planned out, been planned out well in advance. Um, 
I can assure you well in advance. The diary was filled by that point. And we planned it all out. And that was then the decision of what we were going to do. Did pray about it beforehand. Make sure it was okay. But some people walk in tomorrow morning to work with this sense of this is what we're going to do today. Yeah? You've got your day all neatly planned out. You've got it. And James is saying, well, this is what those out there in the city do. So he uses this, this time indication. So today or tomorrow is when we decide to do something, not God's decision. When he says about going to the city, it's our decision which place we are going to. We have decided our steps, not God. Going to spend a year here and a year there. Again, it's deciding actually where we're going to live, not God. And this is what James is saying. Those out there do this. Again, we're going to carry on business and make money. Again, it's more of an indication of what we are doing with our time while we're there. We're going to do the business. We're going to make the money. And you're thinking, well, there's nothing wrong with making money. There's not. But the fact that all the decisions about when they're going, where they're going, where they're going to live, what business they're going to do, is all about what do you think is going to happen to the money? It's going to be their money, isn't it? And they're going to decide what happens with that money. And this is what James is using in this description of you who say. And it's all about being self Sufficient. Remember, right at the beginning of chapter four, we noted the fact that actually you've got to submit yourself to God. And this is what James is saying. These people have not submitted to God because they have decided everything about their own lives. They've not bothered to ask him. And it's a poison that's in our society, is it not? Stulak states, it is alarmingly commonplace, even among Christians, to be overextended in commitments, to be stressed about, uh, sorry, to be stressed because of time pressures, and finally to become dissatisfied, compulsive people. We all went, oh yeah, that's out there. But what did I say to you about James wrote this? It was pointing out the poison that can affect the church. It's the poison that can affect the church. So just take a moment for yourself to reflect. We all agree, cerebrally, in our brains, do we not, that Jesus is returning one day. Amen? Amen. Excellent. And we know he's coming to judge us all, ultimately. But he's coming in glory. He's coming in power. And those that follow him, we know where we're going. Amen? Amen. That was a bit less. We know where we're going. Amen? Amen? Excellent, that's good. Maybe we need a bit more teaching about where we're going (laughs) and what we're going to become. But we don't know the hour or the day, do we? Even Jesus himself said, I don't know the hour or the day, only the Father knows. And James is writing to them saying, well, hang on a minute. If you don't know any of this, how can you make decisions about what you're doing tomorrow? let alone what you're doing this afternoon. We all assume the sun's coming up tomorrow, don't we? It might be a bit chillier now. Wasn't it amazing on Friday? That was ridiculous. I'm walking around the shop at 10 o'clock in the morning in a T-shirt and trousers. (laughs) I realised that came out. I was going to come out wrong at that point. But we just assume, but then we're all shocked now because the temperature's dropping off. We thought, why is this not consistent? It's not meant to be. But we assume the sun is going to come up. We assume the moon will be out later on, don't we? We think this is all what's going to happen. And James is trying to point out, but hang on a minute. In verse 14, you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Your life is temporary. Why do you think everything else is going to be permanent? Those out there think tomorrow is going to happen, and it may well do.
you are but a mist. Poof! That is your life. Hear me very carefully. Your life is literally poof. How often do you hear yourself say, where's the day gone? I can't believe it's November already. That to me, when you realise you're saying that, that should be a measure of how much your life is poof. So why do we live our lives as though tomorrow will be there already. Now, this is where I'm not very good. This is something I'm interjecting from being away. We decided to nip up to London on, on Thursday. It was pre-planned in advance, and we ended up going to London Museum. Museum, Museum of London. And while we was in the... Um, and it's, you know what museums are like, or any place. They, once you finish the tour, you sort of end up in the shop. It's amazing how that exit comes into the shop and I made that as we walked up I was clearly walking along with a sort of admin manager type stuff didn't realize this because I went oh look there's a shock we come into the shop at which point she smiled saw a tabard etc and just went yep and that was it <laughs> it's fine acknowledgement of that but there was a book there and I'm sorry I can never say it correctly carpe diem uh, seize the day seize the day and there was this whole book of wonderful sayings about how you should seize the day. Do you know, not once was there anything from the Bible. There was one thing that said proverb, and I thought, oh, no, it wasn't. I think it was just, just a saying of the day. It was a contemporary culture saying. Proverb can just, you know, be a saying. But I sat there and I thought, yeah, seize the day. And I understood some of the rhetoric behind it. It was good. It was good stuff. Some of it was like, yeah, today is today. Don't think tomorrow's going to happen. So James is saying, why do you live like tomorrow's going to happen? You make all these decisions without submitting them to the Lord first. And by the way, it's not make the decision, Lord, please, will you bless this decision? It's actually, Lord, what decision do you want me to make? There's a difference. So he says, to make that very clear in verse 15, instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. If it's the Lord's will. Or the other phrasing, by God's grace. I used to remember, he's not here now, he's gone, isn't he? Um, I used to say, um, I always used to say to someone like Timmy, for instance, I used to remember in my early days at leadership team, you say, see you next, see you Sunday, or see you tomorrow, or whatever, depending on what meeting we just finished, etc. And he used to sort of say to me, by God's grace. He used to be, what do you mean? That'd be tough. See you tomorrow. Don't worry. It's that sort of, yeah? Now I say it more often probably than he does. Because it is true. And James is saying, listen, that is out there in the world, that that's going to happen. It infects the church, this concept. We might say verbally, oh yes, by God's grace. But do you live your life like that the other six and a half days of the week? James is trying to give us this sort of cure. And also, as he's talking about if it's the Lord's will, there's a recognition in this that we dwell in God's grace all the time. If it's God's will, you must be dwelling in his grace as well. Yes? You get the... So our lives should be lived by the term, and I like this, because people think, oh, well, to be reliant upon God's grace and for him to make decisions on what I'm going to do today, I don't really do anything. I'll just sit and wait. I won't get out of bed unless God tells me. I'd like to try that one one day. <laughs> yeah, that won't work. But there's this sense sometimes of not wanting to actively do anything. It's almost a passive waiting. Well, that's not what James is talking about. He talks all along about relying on God. And I like this. Grace reliance is a term that I've read, and I like that. 
And it should be, therefore, then we do not need to strive for God's favor by doing things madly. We do not need to be self-reliant. We need to be not deeds-reliant. We need to be grace-reliant. So by submitting to God every day, you know, it does, when it says take up your cross, that is actually an active thing that you do every day. It's about relying on God, submitting to him because of his grace. Grace, reliance. God, this is your time. This is your day. This is your job. This is your home. This is your voluntary work I'm doing. This is, you know, and you keep going. This is your college. God, what do I do here today? Now, doesn't stop you planning way ahead things like pensions or whatever, saving. God wants us to be good stewards of what he gives us, but you ask him. But I would say, if we burn ourselves out by doing too much, are we actually relying upon God's grace? If you burn yourself out doing too much, are you actually submitting the time to God? I.e., God, what do you want me to do? Or do you think you need to pick up and do everything for everyone else? It's God's time, not yours. And funny enough, it's actually saying you need to rely upon God's grace. So verse 17, anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. If you know you're meant to rely upon God and you don't do it, you sin. That's what's being said there. It's not just that you're a sinner and you're terrible. It's you need to rely upon God. Ask God. Sit in his grace. If you don't do that, you sin. And it's the same act. We know that those that don't follow Jesus, as far as we're concerned, where they're heading to is not a very nice place, yeah? And we go, oh, they're sinning. Well, we're no different. If we don't rely upon God's grace, which is there and abounding and full of it, and therefore then for us to live, we sin if we don't do that. It's not take it or leave it. He's giving it there, saying, rely on this, please. It's not your money, it's not your time, it's mine. Help, let me use it wisely for you. Let's read chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. The English doesn't rendition this now listen very well because it really is a real negative. It's a make sure you are listening with your ears. It's the rich people. I could go through the arguments with you about is it the rich people in church? Is it the rich people that sort of attend church but aren't Christians yet? Or is it the rich people that don't come anywhere near church and they're out there in the main community? Well, the scholarly argument has come to the conclusion that James is actually doing a prophetic condemnation 
of the oppressing rich people in the cities. Remember, this letter is written to the Christians who have been dispersed out, who are not very wealthy anymore, and actually being quite oppressed and persecuted for their faith. So this is a throw out there that sort of James is trying to say um, to the rich in that city, this is what you're like. The people in this church, you know, congregation have earned their wages and you are not paying them so it's for the church to see that God recognizes that God's saying I'm not silent to your pleas church I know what's going on but actually it's also a prophetic condemnation of the rich people for them to hear it but it's also a warning a warning to the church to make sure that they do not become materialistic it's very easy to get caught up, very easy to get caught up in what you see and you perceive to be great wealth that others have. And for us, maybe as churches, persecution in other countries happens, real persecution in other countries happens, not here. But to see that sort of sense of poverty and to be trying to grasp the wealth that's out there can be a real pull. You might gain a little bit, and you think, oh, I'm okay. And then you sort of lose it, and you become downcast by this. You think, well, where is God in all of this? And here, James is trying to have a go at the rich people, but also saying to the church, be careful. Do not be consumed by materialism. Do not be consumed by the progress of wanting wealth. It's back to that concept of that your life is but poof. Everything is temporary. And you can see that by your silver and gold have corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you. He's using the same imagery almost as, um, you know, food. If you store food in the harvest vats type thing, it rots after a while, doesn't it? Anybody have their food go beyond their sell-by date and you've forgotten about that long-lost packet that's been sitting in the bottom of the fridge or been sitting in the bottom of your pantry or something, yeah? And you pulled it out and it... Well, what can I say? That definitely doesn't look edible right now today. It's sort of rotted, yeah? It's the same thing. I mean, gold and silver doesn't exactly rot and corrode particularly. But here he's saying it will do because you've hoarded it. You've had got so much you forgot about it. You've not even touched it or know anything about it. But it's temporary. It's poof. So church, be careful. Don't go crying after wealth. Don't be like the rich people out there. You can't serve both God and money. We know that, don't we? But again, it comes back to our attitude about what I'm going to do tomorrow. God doesn't have a problem with rich Christians. It's their attitude to their wealth that he want to make sure that's correct. We see that originally, if you remember, in chapter 4, verse 3. You do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. Do you remember that? And that is about, well, you want something. You've asked God, but God's not given it to you. Why? Because your motives with it is incorrect. If you're asking for in this particular context here, lots of money, you're not getting it because you're not going to use it for God's glory. God does not have a problem with rich Christians because actually we don't know what they use their wealth for. And actually the reason you don't hear about it is because they do their deeds in humility. You don't see it. That's the point. Oh, they might have a nice house and a nice car, but that might be just a very small portion of actually their overall wealth. And you don't know what they do with the rest of their money. Our attitude might be, I make this money, but it's all for God's kingdom. And it goes out the other way. You can't judge by appearances. But James here is really making sure that the church doesn't get trapped by materialism, by wealth. It's very, very easy. Isn't it? Come on, isn't it? Very easy. All of us can fall into that trap.
And so just to point out that he was having a go at the rich people outside of the church, it makes it very well that you have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. Here, the innocent men that were not opposing you is meaning the Christian community. So it is this prophetic condemnation of the rich. They've not paid their wages. They've not done anything at all right. And they probably will justify, well, it's those weird Christian way people. But James is saying that's just wrong. And we know that it's directed at them because he now carries on talking to the church. Verses 7 to 11, he says, Be patient then, brothers. Back to that address of brothers. Until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the time of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Church is being persecuted. Church is not getting their due wages. James is saying, be patient. The Lord is coming. Now, this was written around about late 40 AD. And we have to be very cautious when we read words like that because we think, well, that's 2,000 years on and the Lord still hasn't come. What does he mean by that? It was seen in lots of the early letters that the early church misunderstood Jesus. Won't be anything new there then. And guess what? 2,000 years on, there ain't nothing new now. Sometimes we misunderstand our Lord. And they were under some understanding that it was a strong possibility. He literally meant, he was, when he talks about uh, coming in their lifetime, you know, a generation will not pass away until you see the day of the Lord. They sort of saw that as like in their lifetime when you were coming. They misunderstood what it meant by the Lord is coming soon. So that could be some of that in there as well. But they slowly realized that that was incorrect. You see that in the later letters and that band around. And to be honest with you, our Lord could be coming soon for each of us at any moment. We don't know what's round the corner. We don't know what's happening this afternoon. We don't know what's happening tomorrow. But he's asking them to be patient. You know, do not be like the rich. Do not crave or covet their wealth. It is be patient. Now, but the problem is this patience sometimes, wait for the Lord to come. Again, I said it's about this passive patience. Just sit there and do nothing. Don't do anything else until you get what you deserve. Your just reward, your wages. But it's not. This description of this farmer who waits for the autumn and spring rains, he's patient for them. What does a farmer do? Does he just wait for the spring rain to arrive up? Or does he previously ploughed the field, sowed the seed to get the food, hasn't he? He's worked the ground to make sure that it's ready and prepared for when the spring rain comes to make it grow. James is using that description for us. So don't sit back and just wait for the Lord to turn up on the day i.e., you know, you might be praying, Lord, please bring your awesome power. Um, I wait for you to uh, bring that other person to Christ, and I'll do nothing other than pray. But you've got to prepare the ground. You've got to sometimes open up the conversation. It's that. I can't really talk to you about plowing fields, because we don't do that here in urban Greenford, do we? Cutting down trees is about as close as we get, probably. But that sort of sense of maybe you might mow your lawn. But for us, it's that sense of you've got to keep preparing the ground. You hopefully and patiently wait for the Lord to send the rain, i.e. 
his spirit to then convict the person, that that person might eventually then turn to Christ. (coughs) But you don't sit back. You carry on preparing the ground, developing the relationship. Developing the relationship can take a long plowing of field, can it not? And this is why he's using this. Be patient, brothers and sisters, but don't sit on your backsides waiting. But submit your time to the Lord. And there's also this thing about don't grumble against each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. Now, we might see that as moaning at each other about each other, but it's not. It's about don't grumble about the work that needs to be done. Don't moan about the fact that, you know, God is asking you to do stuff out in the community or in your workplace and don't moan at each other about it and say, well, you don't seem to be doing anything at the moment. Chris, you're not doing anything at the moment. You're just sitting here while I'm doing the talking. Unbelievable. Do you know the hours I've had to prepare for this? But I have no idea what Chris did this week. Alandra wants she did more than me, probably. Nice to see you too. For those who may not have picked that up, somebody's mobile phone's just gone off and said, nice to see me. It was an accident, so it's not nice to see me then, Ola, no? Are you ploughing that field? Because you're digging a big hole. (laughs) But it's saying don't grumble because you don't know what the other person's done the other six days of the week. And I'll come back to this, actually, funny enough. I recognise there are people I can see in this congregation now. You have no idea what they have done during the week. There are people here that do things for others quietly, in humility, behind the scenes. They don't shout it back rooftops. You don't know they're doing it. We only find out sometimes that people are doing it because, you know, you hear something, you get a story, and you pick up as you go along. So wait patiently. Keep power in the field, though. It's an active patient. Wait for God to do something. God will do something, but don't not do anything. Keep going. And being suffering, and this is, don't forget the Christian brothers are suffering. This suffering is actually a normal part of Christian life. It is part of our walk. He's talked about it throughout the whole letter. Suffering is part of the normal Christian walk. Amen? Amen. See, that's less. Suffering is part of the normal Christian walk. Amen? Amen? It really is. This idea that you're not meant to suffer, to use a term that I keep hearing every now and again, is a dream that comes from a theology that comes from across the lake on the other side of another continent. It's the American dream. And anything that comes out of various other areas, we seem to like importing. This idea that you're not meant to suffer is wrong. I don't see that anywhere in the Bible. And I most certainly don't see it in our Lord Jesus Christ, who we said is an awesome God. If he suffered... How dare we expect anything less? So wait patiently. Keep working for the Lord even when you are suffering. And he uses the examples of the prophets. We would look at the prophets and think, wow, look how God spoke to them, how they opened up to the nations, and look how they suffered. And yet we'll go, they were people of God. Yeah, they were. And they suffered. Want to be known as a person of God? Do you? You're going to suffer for it. Good, well done. Some of us are getting there. Verses 12 to 20. And I know it's a big chunk, but this is the conclusions. Above all, my brothers, do not swear... Not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. 
or you will be condemned. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring him back, remember this. You Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Verse 12, above all, my dear brothers, do not swear, is not just about swearing an oath in a law of court, court of law or not. It is more than that. Let your yes be yes and your no be no is about not being double-minded. It's about having honest speech. He's using a phrase here that uh, uh, states that the uh, Pharisees used to make oaths in front of crowds of people. The teachers of the law would make great oaths about what they're going to do for the Lord in front of the crowds of people. But depends upon how they say the words, depends upon the level of the oath and how committed they are to it. So, how can I best explain this? simply is that they might say, oh yes, we will do that, and I will say that in the name of the Lord, and then they get out of it by getting somebody else to do it for them. But they have sort of delegated it, and that's okay. Or they might pay money to get out of doing the oath. Lots of different ways of doing it. But they would make this grandiose show in front of the crowd about what they're going to do, and they would go, oh, very, very good. Oh, he's good, isn't he? Look at that. He's going to do that for the Lord. And he's, he's swear by it on the temple as well, or whatever. He's sworn it by heaven and earth. Oh, wow. He's brilliant. And then actually behind the scenes, he sort of gets out of it or sort of fades away and doesn't do it. And people then forget about it. But he still looks like he's got a good rep. James is saying, don't do that. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. If you get asked to do something and you say yes, do it. That's honest speech. If you're asked to do something and you know you really can't do it, you haven't got the time or whatever else, just say no. Nothing wrong with saying no. It's about honest speech. And it's also about not using God as a fruit machine. So easy to... Go, oh, Lord, if you do this, I will do this, 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 and this, yeah? That's the fruit, me fruit machine mentality. If I put in this pound, I might just get what I want. I sworn an oath to God. Therefore, God will now answer my prayer the way I want it done. That's no submission. It's back to that no submission. You must submit. It's not your time. It's not your money. It's not your life. Your life is but poof. It's God's. Can't treat God like a fruit machine. Yeah, I'll scratch your back, Lord, if you scratch mine. That's not a term we'd use, but that's what you're saying sometimes when you are saying, but Lord, if you do this, I'll do this, this, and this. It's that same term. I have heard people's stories. I heard him very recently, a testimony. I asked somebody, how did you come to know Jesus? And they said, well, I actually prayed for a sick relative. And I asked God, if you're really out there, could you heal this person? And I will follow you for the rest of my life. It will prove to me who you are. The person got healed. They've committed their life to Jesus. But I, Now, that is somebody coming to Christ. And I think God allows grace in that. But I think once you become a Christian... You shouldn't be treating God like that. You don't need to. He's not asking your deeds to answer your prayers. He does it because of his grace.
So then let's just look at these ways of praying. From verse 13 to 16. If anyone of you is in trouble, he should pray. This is what Stulak states. In James's view, oaths and prayers are simply the verbal expressions of underlying stances of unbelief and faith. If you give an oath, ask for an oath in God, there is no belief. You don't have belief that God will answer it in his faith because you're trying to twist his arm. By the way, if you ever try and twist God's arm, I can guarantee you'll lose every time. It's about being double-minded. But here, what he's saying in 13 to 18 is literally, don't swear to promise to do something for God, but just pray to God. That's the point of this. He should pray. Don't swear by heaven and earth, just pray. If you're in trouble, pray. And verse 13 is when to pray. If anyone's happy, let them sing songs of praise. If anyone is sick, should call the elders. Prayer It's about when to pray, which is in both the good times and the bad times. In all circumstances. Now, the calling of the elders of the church. Calling of the, verse 14, is how to pray. Now, calling of the elders of the church, in James's view, is not the, and oh, if the elders come and pray for me, I've pulled the right handle on the fruit machine. All three bars are going to go, cha-ching, 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 and out comes the answer. That is not what is being said here. This is actually about, and we do here call the elders, and we do, as here leadership team, sometimes pull people out, and we do pray. We do anoint with oil. I do recognize we do that. But our prayer is no more effective than everybody else's if it's prayed in submission to God through the Spirit. And this is what this is about. This is talking about... You ask for the elders, you're actually submitting to God's authority. You are submitting to the authority that God has put in place. And therefore then, as Stulak puts it, the fact that the sick person calls the elders is an expression of their faith, which is one condition of an effective prayer. The fact the elders are the ones called is an expression of submission and unity in the church which are additional conditions for pray, powerful, powerful praying, i.e. calling the elders is just an image that here that James is trying to say, is saying actually you're submitting to God. And actually that is the condition of a powerful prayer, is your submission to the Lord. And when you're submitting to the Lord, it is not submit and answer it the way I want it. It's, Lord, I submit to your will and what you want to answer it like. This is what this is. This is what he means. You see that in the submission to the Lord is expressed by praying in his name. Sometimes we say we pray and we go, in Jesus' name, amen, don't we? It's in Jesus' name you are praying. It's in his will that you are praying. It's through him and his sacrifice that you are praying. That's not a nice tag on line to finish the prayer nicely so everybody else knows that you're finished. When I said earlier on during the worship time, this sense of the awesomeness of God, I think we forget that when the name Jesus in reference to Jesus Christ, is mentioned. It is an awesome calling. It's an awesome name that you are calling upon. Not fruit machine calling, a submission calling. In your name, Lord, in your will, in your grace, in relying on you, I pray this prayer. Amen? Amen. I haven't finished the sermon. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. Here he's trying to say the faith is reliance on God. Now it's a real struggle, that verse, I'll be honest with you, because it should be, well, I've prayed hard and long, yet I'm not well. Where am I lacking in faith? 
And there's lots of teaching that goes around that says, ah, well, if you've not been healed, it's because of some hidden sin, because they take up the rest of this passage about confessing your sins. Being ill does not mean you've sinned. We live in a broken, fallen world. Whether you like it or not, we do. And as much as I would love for us all to be able to pray for everybody to be healed, and everybody is, they're not. And this other misnomer that Jesus healed everybody he came across, no, he didn't. You're not reading the Gospels with enough open eyes if you think that. He healed those whom the Father called him to heal. And it's because you've not been healed does not mean you've sinned. Paul, the Apostle Paul, had a terrible eye problem all his life. And he asked God to heal it. But God said, no, my grace is sufficient. So please, let's not believe that because somebody is sick and they've not been healed because we prayed about it, it's because of some unconfessed sin in them. It is not about that. This confessing your sins to each other is, again, back to this idea of the unity of the church. The unity in submission to God. And then he uses the example of Elisha in that this was a powerful, righteous man who was just like, just like, just like us. He submitted to God's authority and his prayer life was powerful. Verse 19 to 20. My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. That ending is the same as the beginning. It's about being double-minded. Be solely for the Lord. If you see somebody who knew the truth and then wanders from it, and you bring them back, you've covered over a multitude of their sins, not your own sins. You've already been covered because of the grace of God. They've wandered from the truth. They've wandered away from the Lord. They are going down a path that is going to lead them to death. But if you are able to turn them around and pull them back, you've covered a multitude of their sins because they've come back under the grace of God. And you see that throughout this whole letter where James has been going on about not bad-mouthing brothers and sisters, not about slagging each other off. It's all of that that he's trying to pull this unity of the church together. You've got to try and pull everybody back. Don't let them wander away. Try your best. Doesn't negate Matthew 18, 17 that says, somebody at the front, and this is back to this truthful speech, somebody at the front might say, oh, you know, I'm sorry that I've done this, this, and this. So sorry. And the church here in James, oh, they're forgiven, fantastic, you've pulled them back. But actually, if you see then, later on, their life get turned around and go all wrong again, and they start bad-mouthing, They didn't truly repent. Their oath before the church wasn't real, was it? Their yes wasn't their yes, and their no wasn't no. James is throughout this entire passage trying to say, come back to the Lord in unity. Don't be bad-mouthing. Be patient in your suffering, but you will suffer. This whole letter for me has been about this, being members of God's household and what it should look like, should look like. As Stulak puts, and I will finish on this, these are the realities of life with which James concludes this letter. There is truth to be followed. There is death to be avoided. There is ministry to give to each other. James has called us to serve both God and sinners and to be a church of true unity and true focus for God. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for James. He grew up with Jesus. 
and he wants to help the church of Jesus Christ to grow up as well. Father, I pray for each and every one of us that we do grow in maturity and we grow in unity. And it's all for your glory and for your kingdom. It's not about us. It's always about you. Pray, Lord, all of us, all of us will walk out of here today having grown. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.